An unprecedented attack on a mosque in Egypt's Sinai region has killed more than 300 people, including 27 children. Why has the Sinai Peninsula become a security nightmare for the government? And does there need to be a new approach to dealing with it? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. Criminal and cowardly. That's how the Egyptian president described an attack on a Sufi mosque on Friday. Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has vowed to respond with what he calls brute force. More than 300 people were killed in what's seen as the worst attack in Egypt's modern history. It began with an explosion inside a Rauda mosque in the town of Bir al-Abid. Men, women and children were then shot by armed men as they tried to flee. Since coming to power three years ago, President Sisi has been fighting an insurgency by armed groups in the Sinai. Here's some of what he had to say about the attack. This tragic event, this heinous act of terrorism, will make us more robust, more strong in our battle against terrorism. We cannot be intimidated. Our resolve cannot be dented. We will remain more united following this event. The Egyptian army will take revenge and they will restore order and security with an iron fist in the following days. The attack was in the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula. The entire Sinai was occupied by Israel from 1967 until 1982. Bedouin tribes in the region have always shown their anger against the government for its failure to address poverty and unemployment. And since the turmoil that followed the Arab Spring in 2011, the area has become a hotbed for armed groups. Ansar Beit El Maqdis, which has pledged allegiance to ISIL, has been active in the region. It now calls itself Sinai Province and has taken control of a large part of the Sinai, which has been under a state of emergency since October 2014. Well, let's bring in our, our guests now. Joining us in Berlin is Ahmed Bedawi, a senior researcher at the Center for Middle Eastern and North African Politics at the Free University of Berlin. In Athens, Timothy Kaldas, a non-resident fellow at Tahrir Institute for Middle East Politics. And in London, Afzal Ashraf, a visiting fellow at the Center of Conflict, Security and Terrorism at Nottingham University. Uh, welcome all of you. Uh, Afzal, let me start with you. Egypt's President Sisi uh, is promising a robust response to this uh, uh, brute force, overwhelming force, as it's called. Is that the right response, particularly in the long term? It isn't uh, the right response on its own. Yes, we uh, need to have a robust response to this sort of terrorism. And if necessary, it has to be a military response. But uh, the rhetoric that he's used of revenge is not the right one. It should be one of justice. Um, so the perpetrators of this crime needs to be, need to be tracked down. They need to be brought to book. And they need to be punished if they're captured. Uh, but it must be done proportionately. Uh, so just rhetorical statements, both verbal and indeed um, behavioral, are not enough. It, one of the things that concerns me is that uh, the Egyptian army in the last few hours claims to have destroyed ammunition drums and other uh, facilities. Well, if they'd known about these facilities, surely they should have destroyed them earlier and not wait for this event to... Uh, destroy them as a, as a statement or as a rhetorical statement of behavior. So I think we have to be very careful that uh, the Egyptian military uh, and the Egyptian government doesn't overreact. It must react proportionately and firmly, but with justice in mind rather than revenge. Timothy Kaldas, does this kind of uh, crackdown work or, or does it risk fueling the problem of extremism there even further? Well, I, th I think uh, to echo uh, to echo uh, my colleague's statements uh, that it, first of all, one has to really uh, review with a degree of skepticism claims by the government of what they're able, what they're destroying and what they're not destroying. We don't have a mechanism for independently verifying their claims. And as he said, if we already knew about the uh, if they already knew about those areas, they should be taking them. Uh, but beyond that, I think that the uh, the issue is that what does CC statement really mean in terms of something new? Uh, there already has been a military campaign against ISIS for years now, and at the conclusion of, of all of that, we have this massive attack yesterday. So clearly that, that strategy alone is inadequate, and there needs to be a review of that strategy, one that's more sophisticated, 
and is able to win over the loyalty and support of the local population rather than uh, uh, antagonize them with uh, draconian curfews and roundups and people getting killed in the crossfire uh, because the government isn't being careful enough. I think that it's, uh, it's important that there be a step back in looking at what has worked and what hasn't because clearly the strategy of a, str a strict military and brutal response as being promised by the president hasn't been enough. So what else can they do? What would be more productive? Ahmed Badawi, what, what, why uh, have the people who've done this chosen to go after uh, Sufi uh, Muslims uh, in particular? Why them? Well, that is one of the puzzling things about this attack, which is, uh, which is not usual in many respects. Uh, one, one idea or one suggestion is that they are targeting Sufis. Uh, this village, Arauda, is, uh, is a stronghold of Sufis in, uh, in, in Sinai. And uh, last year in November, uh, the, uh, the Islamic State, if the Islamic State is indeed the, the Sinai province, is indeed the, the perpetrator, uh, they kidnapped a Sufi uh, follower uh, last November and beheaded him. And uh, soon after, they issued a warning to Sufis in Sinai uh, that they will be that they are blasphemous and that the Islamic State would not allow them to continue practicing their type of Islam in Sinai. So this is one theory why this attack happened in this way. But on the other hand, uh, this village Rauda. Uh, is mostly inhabited by members of one particular tribe, the second largest tribe in Sinai, Sawarka. And this is the first time that we get this wholesale attack uh, with so many people killed before they were targeting uh, specific persons, either because of their religious differences, uh, Sufis or whatever, or Christians, or uh, targeting uh, those people from the tribes in Sinai who were known to be collaborating with the government. This is the first time that, that, that the war uh, extends to such uh, a massive uh, attack on civilians uh, in such large numbers. And the, the worry here is that this would trigger some kind of, uh, of tribal warfare in Sinai. And the whole tribal dynamic, this is one of the weakest points of the strategy of the government in Sinai, not just at the time of uh, during these years, but already from 10, 15 years ago, the strategy of the government, the Egyptian state, uh, to manage the tribal uh, structure in Sinai, I think has been an abject failure. Uh, Afzal Ashraf, what's your take on the um the target here, the, 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 the people who were attacked here, is it because um, they were Sufi uh, Muslims, as, as has been suggested, or, or is it more to do with the fact uh, that they are perceived to uh, have been uh, supporting the government's actions uh, in, in this region? Well, we can't really answer that question with any certainty, as none, none of us at this stage know precisely who's behind it and why they appear to have done this. And it's very likely to be, uh, in almost certainly, um, a political motive. Uh, and the religious or sectarian elements are just a fig leaf, uh, an excuse for conducting these attacks. It doesn't matter whether they were Sufis, whether they are Christians, whether they're another Sunni group. Uh, these people uh, attack soft targets, innocent civilians, uh, in order to do what they think uh, will work for them, and that is to produce shock and horror. So in many ways, the identity of these people is an irrelevance. It's just an excuse to mitigate some of their the worst excesses of what they're doing. Uh, the, the real reason has to be political. And given the number of groups operating in Sinai, I think what we have is a political and security problem that has got out of control uh, and it's a problem that the Egyptian government needs to reevaluate its approach. I don't for a moment suggest that the Egyptian government isn't taking this seriously. I know that the, it is. I've worked with Egyptian security people briefly in the past, uh, and I know they're very serious about this. Uh, and they've made great efforts to understand this extremism. What I think they need to do now is to make great efforts to understand their own security culture and see how they can improve and adapt it 
to produce success because the efforts have so far not produced success. Uh, Timothy Kaldas, given um, the, 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 the reaction to this particular attack, the, the, the revulsion at the, so many innocent people uh, being killed, uh, could this ha be a, perhaps a turning point, uh, may, may, maybe not in, in, in the government response, but certainly in public opinion by, by swinging them against, squarely against uh, the extremists? Well, I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, the Egyptian public, by and large, is pretty, uh, pretty uh, clearly opposed to the uh, militant groups and the extremists from quite some time ago. I mean, when you hear people talk about terrorism in Egypt, it's, it's pretty unequivocal in their condemnation and uh, disdain for it. Uh, they see it as not only a threat to their security, but also a threat to their livelihood. Uh, these sorts of attacks damage the economy, damage uh, uh, the attractiveness of Egypt as a place to visit, as a place to do business, and they recognize that. So. Uh, I don't know that it's a turning point in the sense that there was much to turn. Uh, the public has been against this for quite some time, uh, with obviously some exceptions. Uh, I think what, what, what this does, though, is it brings into relief just how far this can go. Uh, now, the, the, when, you, when you're able to basically to attack a mosque and attack worshippers so indiscriminately uh, and perhaps justify that based on uh, members of their tribe working with the state, perhaps based on... Uh, members of the, uh, the mosque's uh, core being Sufis, uh, or both, it's, I mean, the two aren't mutually exclusive, then it becomes very possible that you're going to be able to justify all sorts of violence against the, the entire Egyptian population. Uh, it, everyone can be rationalized in this sort of model, and so it's a very scary prospect um, as the kind of the repertoire of potential targets for ISIS continues to grow um, with these, these growing numbers of civilians that they see as fair game. Uh, so that's quite, quite a, that's a great deal of concern. Ahmed Badawi, why has, be, why has it been so hard to uh, eliminate um, these groups? Uh, and does there need to be a, a whole new approach uh, to the way the government uh, responds to it? The government has been trying recently to, to enlist the support of the tribes in its war with Islamic State, and so far it has not been very successful. Uh, we have to really appreciate the, the delicate tribal structure in Sinai and how this structure has been largely made redundant by the behavior of the government and by the behavior of the Islamic State. Uh, the tribal structure is very important. Tribes are key in, in terms of governance of this part of Egypt. And when we, uh, when we see that uh, the, the people who belong or who are fighting for the Islamic State, they themselves, many of them, come from the same tribes that are now being attacked. And this explains the kind of dilemma that these tribal leaders are in and the government is in. It is very difficult now to disentangle this very messy situation in Sinai where it seems that the tribes are divided amongst themselves. So you get some young radicalized uh, members of the two main tribes in particular, Tarabin and Sawarka. Uh, some of them are now, both of them now are fighting against each other. Some of them who have grievances against the government and the way the government has been neglecting Sinai for so many years have joined the ranks of the Islamists and others who used to work as smugglers now are currying favor with the government and are trying to uh, support the government in its fight with the Islamic State. And I think that is now, uh, the, if you asked before about the turning point, I think the turning point is not in the opinion of, of, of the people against, uh, turning the opinion of the people in Egypt against the Islams. I think the real turning point now is that this, this conflict between uh, Egypt and the Islamic State is taking more and more a tribal dimension, and this, I think, is going to be uh, really problematic in the future. Uh, Timothy Kaldas, what, what's your view on this? How does the, the tribal dimension in, in, in Sinai uh, uh, play into this? Because when, when we're talking about this, th these are grievances that go back to, but go back in the Sinai region to well before uh, Sisi's time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Ahmed's points are excellent on this, uh, and the the reality is that the that northern Sinai and Sinai more broadly, the the population that, that's from there has been neglected by the government for decades. Um, uh, you've, I mean, I've literally heard Bedouin joke that they were better off when the Israelis occupied it, which is a pretty kind of remarkable thing to hear someone say. Uh, you have uh, a lack of medical infrastructure. You have a lack of uh, educational infrastructure. Uh, 
a lot of the tourism jobs didn't go to the, to the locals. It goes to people coming from mainland Egypt that are coming into Sinai to work. Um, and so when the government started cracking down on the, uh, on the illegal trade and contraband, that also affected the livelihoods of a lot of people there uh, and kind of created more tension within those communities uh, economically as it became harder and harder to make a living. Um, and so in that context, the government is trying to win the trust of, of these, uh, of these uh, communities. And uh, it presents an, a wide array of challenges. And now with this attack, there's two possible reactions. One is that it increases the resolve to fight back because of such an egregious attack on them. But the other possibility is that it's such a scary thing to have experienced that it might make them think twice about working with the government, given that this sort of retaliation can be expected. Uh, Afzal Ashraf, uh, it's been said that uh, you can kill a terrorist, but it's much harder to kill an idea. Uh, and and you, you alluded to, the, to this earlier, that the uh, security response by itself is not going to be enough here. Does, does there need to be uh, more attention played to the, the, the grievances uh, of people there that, that we've been uh, talking about there, the economic and, and, and social problems uh, in the region? Yes, indeed, but uh, that attention will only come about when the Egyptian government and the Egyptian security structure uh, escapes the worldview in which it's imprisoned. And this is not a problem with e the Egyptian government and the Egyptian security structure. The US, Europe, and everywhere in the world, we all have a worldview in which we operate. It's only when there is a crisis uh, and we are confronted with failure, or if somebody comes in from the outside with a different worldview and shows the, uh, the Egyptians how they can do things differently, it's only then that uh, things will change. And a real part of that will be to address the grievances which in turn arise to some extent by the way or out of the way in which the security forces operate. Uh, if you have security forces, uh, who are being inspired by their leader to take a robust approach to take revenge, then you can uh, very easily see how th situations might arise that would actually increase rather than reduce the grievances in the local area. And this is why you get this uh, extremism uh, built up uh, and the civil population is sandwiched between the terrorists and the government rather than being um, protected by the government and reducing the chances of extremism. So I think that we do need for the Egyptian government and the Egyptian security forces to accept that they are doing the best they can. Uh, they're making a great deal of effort, but it's not working. And for them to change and, uh, and, and succeed, they're going to have to change the way they approach this problem. And to do that, they should consider outside help, not because uh, they're not worthy of solving it themselves. As I said, when I was working for the U.S. Army and the U.S. government in Iraq, uh, it was easier for me and others who were on the outside to show where the U.S. was failing and, and, and to be able to show them ways of improving their counterterrorism and counterinsurgency effort. Uh, and, and that shouldn't be seen as uh, any sign of weakness or failure of the government. It just needs for them to recognize that they need to do things differently to achieve different results. Uh, Timothy Caldas, uh, you are nodding in agreement to, to, to much of that, but do you think that that's likely uh, to happen uh, at this point? Honestly, no. I mean, I would love to see it happen, though. I would hence the nodding. Uh, I think that, and I think I think that uh, he's absolutely right. Also, that uh, this is a, this is most, this is also a global problem. I think that the way that people envision uh, counterterrorism is overly reactive and overly uh, looking at it through a security prism uh, that's, that's militaristic and that's dependent on the use of force without considering the other variables and how they can work. I mean, there's a lot of conversations about countering violent extremism, uh, but they haven't gotten very far in terms of really affecting the, the fundamentals of how states engage with these challenges. And I, you can understand it from a, from a, public, uh, from a public pressure perspective uh, for a politician to have to stand before their people after an attack like this and say, well, we need to think about this reasonably and how can we approach this? A lot of people also are going to be demanding revenge. A lot of people are going to be demanding the use of force. And it takes a really strong uh, leader to be able to kind of help reframe that conversation and, and move things in a, in a more uh, productive uh, direction. Um, 
But also we have to keep in mind that in the, in the case of Egypt, it's a country that has a security apparatus that has a long history of using repression and violence and torture to uh, achieve its objectives, be they political or security. Um, and so to retrain and, uh, and to transform and reform the way that they, they see their role and to see which tools are, uh, are best at, uh, to be used is a very long and, and difficult uh, project. And um, I don't feel that uh, the, the uh, dynamics currently in the government are right for that to happen. Uh, Ahmed Badawi, if we just take a broader look at this uh, in terms of how this, this uh, compares with uh, the rest of, of the region, and if, if we look at uh, Syria and Iraq and, and how um, ISIS has been on the run in, in, in those countries, and we don't know at this point who's responsible for this attack in Sinai, but uh, it's thought that it's a group that, that has connections uh, with ISIS. Um, does an attack like this, uh, is, it, is it particularly surprising given that, that ISIS is, is very much on the run territorially in the rest of the region and, and that attacks like this uh, do a lot to, to kind of grab attention? Um, I suppose so. I suppose that uh, if ISIS is going to be retreating in Syria and in Iraq, uh, they're not going, they're probably going to push more into, especially into the Sinai. Uh, look, looking at it in a, in a broader perspective, we see commonalities and differences. And the commonalities are quite interesting. In all these places, whether it's Syria or Iraq or Egypt, what we see, we see a state uh, that is not functioning properly. Uh, a mode of governance that is relying on repression, which creates a lot of grievances. And on the other hand, uh, there's no way to, uh, to air these grievances politically. Uh, the repression is touching everybody, even those who are not Islamists, as we see uh, in Egypt. Uh, a lot of the people who are now uh, withering away in prisons are young people who are not Islamists, who are uh, just young people who want to have a better life. So as long as these dynamics continue, uh, you, will get, you will get resistance and you will get violent resistance, uh, mostly from the Islamists, because that's the only ideology that is capable of mobilizing these grievances into the kind of insurgency that we see now in Egypt and elsewhere. So I think, and I agree with, very much with what Timothy said, there is a need to change strategy drastically but I don't see how this is going to happen. He mentioned the difficulty of retraining and creating a new ethos and a new culture among the security forces. But I would like to add to that, I think that the political will is not even there. I think that the, that the diagnosis of the problem, that it is not only a security military problem, but also a sociological problem, an economic problem, and uh, uh, of course it is also a political problem, as long as this realization is not there, then I don't think that the right strategies will emerge to be able to deal with the real structural problems that are giving birth to all these pathologies that we are seeing now. Uh, just uh, briefly in, in the time that we've got left, a uh, minute or so that we've got left, Timothy, uh, how do you see this uh, playing out? Do you, do you fear that things will continue to get worse, at least in the, in the short term? I think, unfortunately, we're going to see another high-profile military campaign without really reviewing where the mistakes were made. And uh, that I think that we're going to continue to see some of the same failures uh, in the future. I think that, I mean, fundamentally, it's worth remembering that just uh, just a week ago, there were threats against this mosque that roadblocks, uh, road checkpoints had been set up in anticipation of a possible attack, and yet ultimately it wasn't prop it wasn't defended effectively enough. Um, and we saw the same thing in Tanta before the attack on that church, where there were uh, there was an attempt on the church the previous week, and even the metal detectors weren't work in working order the day of the attack that uh, that unfortunately was successful. Um, so e so the lack of accountability uh, in the security apparatus and in the in the government more broadly. Uh, results in a situation in which these mistakes keep getting repeated and there's not enough time to reflect on how to change and identify where the problems are, as, uh, as Ahmed just said. And without that, it's difficult to see how there could be any sort of reform and, uh, and progress. All right, we've got to leave it there. Thanks very much to uh, all three of you. Ahmed Badawi, Timothy Kaldas, and Afzal Ashraf. Thanks very much for being on Inside Story. And thank you, as always, for watching. Remember, you can see this program again anytime. Just visit our website, aljazeera.com, and for further discussion, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there 
It is at AJ Inside Story, and you can also tweet me at Hazem Seeker. That's it from me and the whole team here. Bye for now.